is Laura London, and you're listening to Speaking of Jung. Returning to the podcast for episode 54 is Jungian analyst and author of Jung's Map of the Soul, Dr. Murray Stein in Zurich, Switzerland. He holds a Master of Divinity from Yale University and a PhD in Religion and Psychological Studies from the University of Chicago. He trained as a Jungian analyst at the C.G. Jung Institute Zurich and later co-founded the Jung Institute of Chicago, where he worked as a training analyst. Dr. Stein served as president of the International Association for Analytical Psychology and the International School of Analytical Psychology, known as ISAP Zurich, where he is currently a training and supervising analyst. He is the author of many books and articles, and is the co-founder and publisher emeritus of Chiron Publications. The first volume of his collected writings, titled Individuation, is available now, and his latest book, Men Under Construction, a series of three lectures given in the 80s, was published on February 1st. We're here today to discuss the new comeback trailer by BTS, titled Outro Ego. It's part of their forthcoming album, Map of the Soul 7, dropping February 21st. We will be discussing Jung's concept of the ego and looking at the song from a Jungian perspective. Dr. Stein will also be sharing his thoughts on the first single from the album, titled Black Swan, and we will revisit the comeback trailer released last month, Interlude Shadow. You can hear our full analysis of that in episode 53. Dr. Stein is no stranger to this podcast. We recorded our first episode together when I visited his office in Zurich in 2015. You can hear that conversation in episode 9. We then reconnected last spring for episode 42 on Jung's Map of the Soul, episode 44 on BTS's Map of the Soul persona, Episode 47 on The Analyst and the Rabbi, and Episode 49 on Jung's Red Book for Our Time. This interview is being recorded on Friday, February 7th, 2020, through the magic of Skype. Dr. Stein, at the beginning of the last episode, Shadow Interlude, I asked you about Jung's concept of the shadow and how it differs from the persona. In this episode, I want to begin by asking you about Jung's concept of the ego and not only how it differs from the persona and the shadow, but how it differs from the common use term ego. Well, um, it differs greatly from the common use term ego. Let me start there. In common usage, when we say somebody has an ego or a big ego, it's usually uh, uh, we're criticizing them for being selfish or um, uh, narrow-minded, thinking of narcissistic, they have a big ego. Uh, But in Jung's vocabulary, ego is a neutral term. Um, Ego is a Latin word that uh, in in the Latin, ancient Latin language means I. And when the texts from psychoanalysis were translated into English, instead of bringing across the word I, as it's used in German, they say das Ich, the I, instead of translating it uh, that way, they decided, uh, the early translators decided to use uh, Latin equivalents of some of the more technical terms in psychoanalysis. So I became ego. Um, And the translators have been criticized for that because it gives the um, English language version of uh, Freud's writings and Jung's writings, a kind of artificial uh, uh, feeling. They're talking about something called ego, a word that nobody uses in modern language. And um, uh, it it was a bit off-putting, but it simply means the I. Now, everybody has an I, even if it's a small one or a big one. (laughs) Um, And um, it's... uh, Jung defined it as the center of consciousness. Uh, that's all it is, uh, the center of consciousness. 
And Jung sometimes used a metaphor to describe what he means by I. He said, um, uh, imagine that you're walking in a, in a dark forest at night and you can't see anything. Um, and you light a match. Um, and you use the match to light a candle. And then you can see a bit. The ego is like that. The ego is a light in the darkness. Uh, without the ego, uh, we couldn't see anything in the darkness of the unconscious. So the ego lights things up, allows you to see them more clearly. If you have a strong flashlight, you can see far. Um, uh, ego is related to um, a kind of knowledge center that we have in ourselves that we can draw on uh, and we can understand the world around us. Um, it's also um, um, very associated with our sense of a body, of being in a body. The ego and the body are very closely related so that if something happens to the body, uh, the ego suffers. Uh, for instance, if you uh, suffer poisoning or illness, um, your ego strength weakens. You can't function as well. You can't think as well. You get confused. Um, and so um, uh, ego and uh, your sense of body are very connected ordinarily. You can free the ego somewhat from the body, and there are so-called out-of-body states of consciousness. Um, they're rather infrequent, um, sometimes involve, uh, as a part of a trauma, then where a person's consciousness leaves the body that's being traumatized and can gaze from another position. Um, but think of it basically as a center of consciousness. Um, and this can be used for good or ill. Uh, what you do with your consciousness or how the ego directs itself is uh, based on uh, a number of complex factors, but it does have a certain amount of free will to make decisions, uh, what you want to do, what you want to eat, what you want to wear, and so on. You can make decisions. The ego is involved in decision-making. Um, so it doesn't have the negative connotation that it has in common parlance when, some, when, we, when we speak about somebody having an ego. Uh, everybody has an ego. And sometimes it's a big ego, or uh, there's egotism, or egotistic. So that's not Jung's concept that is that's being right. referred to. And so then Just something different. Mm -hmm. Something different. And how does the ego, our ego, differ from our persona? Well, you could say the ego uses the persona. The ego, I, I spoke to somebody the other day, and he's a, a rather conscious man in his 50s. And he said, you know, I feel like I walk around with um, – a bunch of patches on my on myself. Um, I've won a lot of awards. I've won prizes. I've done this. I've done that, and um, that's what I show to people. Now, there's a difference in his case between the ego, the I, and what he's showing. So he's aware of a distance between the ego and the persona. If the ego is identified with the persona, then it's very hard to separate them. Then um, the uh, the ego and the persona um, uh, become one thing, uh, psychologically speaking. And um, you see in the in the song that we're going to discuss that there is a, a kind of liberation from that identification with a with a persona uh, on the part of the of the singer Ob or J Hope as he's called. Um, that. Um, uh, it's a, an important part of psychological development to um, create a certain distance between the ego and the persona. Persona is a mask we wear to adapt to the world around us, to function in the world around us. Um, but the ego is behind that, uh, so to speak. It's, it's the uh, person behind the mask. How does the ego differ from Jung's concept of the self? The self is uh, the all-inclusive concept in Jung's psychology. <clears throat> when Jung uses the term self, he's not talking about the ego. Again, in parlance, common parlance, mm -hmm. when we say uh, himself, myself, the self, 
we're talking usually about the ego. We're talking about consciousness or, uh, you know, a, a fairly um, obvious or superficial aspect of the personality. When Jung uses the concept self, it's a really big term. It's all-inclusive. It's the whole personality, conscious and unconscious. So it reaches very deep um, into the unconscious uh, to include all the parts that are active within an individual personality. And the ego is um, rests on the surface. Now, they have some similar features in that they're both centering devices, uh, centering instruments, if you will, in, in the psyche. The uh, ego centers consciousness. It brings a, uh, a focal point to consciousness. Um, the self uh, centers and balances uh, the whole psyche. So... Um, the relationship between conscious and unconscious is um, controlled or governed by the self. Whereas the ego is limited to the conscious part, um, pretty much, not mm -hmm. totally, but pretty much. The self includes uh, the whole uh, picture of the psyche. Okay. And speaking of the unconscious, where does the shadow fit into all of this? Well, the shadow is the first layer down, uh, the first basement. If uh, we go back to the image of the house that I think we used in a previous session where mm -hmm. we said the psyche is like a house with several levels. We live on the ground level, but then there's a basement, and the, the basement uh, uh, is the uh, shadow, and then you can go below the basement into deeper layers of the unconscious. Um, but it's the... Um, it's the hidden part um, of the uh, personality. The, the ego is somewhat aware of what's in that basement and somewhat not. If the material in the shadow basement is really repressed, uh, severely repressed for some reason, like trauma, um, then the ego isn't aware of it. Um, but the ego is aware of some of it. Um, and so in the song, for instance, uh, Interlude Shadow, we hear... Suga singing uh, about his shadow um, um, uh, ambitions and desires, and I want to be rich, I want to be a pop star, I want to be on the top, all of those kind of things that uh, one would normally hide from the public, mm -hmm. you know, would show them in the persona. But the ego is somewhat aware of them. And if you look into the shadow, you become somewhat aware of them. Now, deep inner work will eventually expose more and more of the shadow, uh, to consciousness, and it usually is very difficult and painful work to realize um, those aspects of the shadow that you don't want to be aware of and you um, really um, feel are, uh, you want to deny or even a part of yourself. Those are the parts we usually project into other people to get rid of, get them out of it. <laughs> Right. So let's talk about the new song that was released uh, it was Sunday here in the United States. It is called Outro Ego. And I believe it is an outro because we had intro persona last year for the introduction to Map of the Soul persona. Then last month, we had Interlude Shadow, which you and I discussed in episode 53. And now we have outro ego. And I have been collecting questions from people on Twitter. And one thing that kept coming up over and over again is, why was ego chosen, do you think? I mean, we don't know, we can only speculate. Why was ego chosen to be the outro? We don't really know what outro means. Does it mean it's the um, the end of the whole series, uh, that they're going out on this note of ego? Or is it going to be the end of this album, the last song on the album, but there will be more albums to come, which I hope will be the case, mm -hmm. because they aren't anywhere near through or finished with the uh, with the map of the soul. There, there are still other chapters to go, other levels to explore. Um, but it is a, a kind of, um, you could say, a concluding point. Um, and I was thinking about that um, 
uh, what what does this song mean uh, in the lives of BTS? What are they saying about themselves? You know, I consider BTS a single personality of sorts, even though the songs are sung by individuals like J-Hope and Suga and so on. But they're singing for the group, I think. And this group is getting older. They're not boys anymore. Mm -hmm. They started as a boys group. Um, uh, the K-pop are usually very young, uh, adolescents, um, uh, teenagers. But these uh, BTS uh, performers now are in their mid-20s. And so they're about to reach another stage of life um, uh, in the individuation um, process um, where they're becoming um, almost more than young adults. They'll soon be hitting midlife in their 30s. Um, and so um, this coming to oneself as, a, as an ego um, is a part of that uh, process in the first half of life. Um, and I think what this song does is, in a sense, celebrate that moment when we realize, I am I. I am not you. I am not other. I am I. And um, I, I listen to the song again, and it, uh, it has many aspects to it, but it is a kind of celebration of that moment when, as Jung said, there was a moment in his life, he writes about it in his autobiography, he said, it's as though I stepped out of a cloud and suddenly I realized I am I. I am myself. Um, so this coming to oneself um, and affirming one's uniqueness, one's uh, individuality, that's ego. I'm, uh, I'm one of a kind. I'm uh, here for a short period of time in the history of the planet. Um, you get that in the song. Their temporality is very much a part of this song, a sense of time passing. So um, I think it's a moment of development. Um, and maybe it's an outro in the sense it's finishing uh, one stage of life and is about to um, uh, inaugurate or uh, take up uh, the next stage of life. That would be my thinking about it. And you mentioned the word individuation. And for those listening who are not familiar with the term, would you briefly tell us what that is? Individuation is the, uh, the word that uh, Jung used to describe um, psychological development through the whole lifespan. The lifespan is um, the entire course of a person's life from the time that they are um, uh, a fetus in their mother's womb until their last breath is given up uh, and they pass away. Um, that uh, is the lifespan uh, of the individual and what happens psychologically within that time period uh, developmentally is what Jung called individuation. And it has several phases and stages. Basically, Jung said there are two main uh, stages of uh, the individuation uh, process, the first half of life and the second half of life. And then, of course, we could go on and on about this topic. There are sub-phases and sub-stages. Um, but um, the, uh, the word individuation means also uh, becoming the individual that you are born to be. You are born with a certain code, you could say, a genetic code, but also a psychological code. And the um, emergence of that uh, potential into a lived life, into a life experience, and development of talents and abilities, and, um, uh, and um, various psychological features like typology, extroversion, introversion, thinking, feeling, all of that uh, belongs to this unfolding process of becoming the individual fully that you could possibly be. And that's what we uh, speak about is full life individuation. And in analysis, we encourage people to discover themselves and work on themselves so that they can individuate according to their own ground plan. This is not imposed from the outside by somebody. It's an inborn uh, capacity for growth. 
Mm -hmm. And it's interesting you mentioned that because when I first learned of BTS, which was last year, uh, right before Map of the Soul Persona was released, and you and I did those episodes, I had a hard time differentiating them. I couldn't tell them apart. I didn't know their names. And it's not because they look alike, um, but they're all um, Korean men around the same age. They dress very similarly. Um, Their makeup and their hair is quite similar, although uh, they do change hair color. But it took me a while to learn who was who. And now when I see them, they couldn't be more different to me. They're so different from each other. I see so many unique aspects of each one of them. So um, perhaps as they've grown and matured, they've been together seven years now. That's why uh, it said the new album is going to be called Map of the Soul 7. One of the reasons why. There's seven of them. They've been together for seven years. And um, Another thing I wanted to mention is you said something about midlife and the second half of life. And I just wanted to point out, which I often do, that we tend to think of midlife or that somebody is middle-aged when they're in their 50s. But technically, and Jung has even mentioned this, um, transitioning into the second half of life occurs in the late 30s early 40s. And I've studied astrology for many years, and the so-called midlife crisis transits occur in the late 30s, early 40s. Mm -hmm. Well, um, um, it's interesting you bring up astrology. Jung was very interested in astrology, and he may have um, gotten his conception of the midlife, point of midlife, uh, from from what you just uh, mentioned from astrology. His own midlife crisis occurred between the ages of 37 and 45, 43 in that period. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the classic uh, time period when people make the transition from the first half of life to the second half of life. And this has been studied empirically. It isn't true in every case. Some people have an earlier seemingly at least midlife transition, other other people somewhat later. Um, but that's the uh, more or less the classic time. Uh, and, and it's when one starts expecting it. If, if a, a patient comes to me for therapy and they um, uh, I ask their age and I get a sense of where they are in their lives, mm-hmm. you know, if they're in that period, uh, mid to late 30s, uh, I start thinking about this uh, transition into the second half of life and looking for signals that that might be what's taking place. Mm -hmm. And uh, you wrote a classic book about that called In Midlife, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Uh, Just to finish covering this song, Outro Ego, in looking at some of the lyrics, one of the lines says, time flows forward. And he speaks of memories memories of when he was a child. And there's even a photograph of him as a young boy uh, in the video. And he also speaks about fate. And one of the lines says, touch of the devil and fateful recall. Uh, He talks about fate's choice. I was wondering if you wanted to discuss any of that. Yeah, I think it it has to do with this realization that... um, You know, the, the decisions that we make, uh, the important decisions that we make in life, um, um, really determine our course. You know, when you're young, you think, well, there are so many different directions you could take, so many things you could do. Maybe you'll try this for a while. That doesn't work out. You could try something else for a while. Mm-hmm. That's what we call the puer attitude. You know, many potentials, you don't settle on anything in particular. But uh, for these um, performers, um, their fate was sealed when they were identified as having this particular (laughs) ability and they were taken into training and they were successful. The the decision to go along with that, you know, whoever made that decision becomes their fate and their destiny. That is their life and that's irreversible. Mm 
And when you get that sense that time flows forward, it doesn't go backward, uh, you're living in the ego. Ego registers temporality. Uh, before the ego is very well developed, or if it is terribly weakened by, um, by a dementia or Alzheimer's or something like that, um, time doesn't exist uh, for the infant. Time uh, is not a factor. Uh, but for uh, as you grow older, you begin to realize more and more that time just flows forward and that you have to take that into account as you make your decisions. You cannot go back into the past. Now, he remembers his past. There's a kind of nostalgia for it. It's important to remember the past, but you cannot go back there. You know, that famous novel, uh, Le Comer Angel, you can't go back to your childhood. And that sealing off of that possibility to go back into your earlier years, the realization you can't do that, um, is a very important moment in life. Um, then you have to face the present and the future. And that's a turning point also in development, that, uh, that the ego is aware of temporality and its cost and its consequences, that the choices and decisions we make have effects not only in the moment, but for, for the future. Um, and so he's coming to that realization in this. What, why he speaks about touch of the devil, I'm not sure. Shadow, devil is shadow, so maybe the devil was involved in his decision uh, to become a, a BTS star. Uh, that is, devil being uh, ambition, I want to be a rock star, I want to be rich and famous, which he sang, which uh, Suga sang about in the Shadow album, Shadow Song. Um, uh, so, you know, th there is a touch of the devil in some of the choices we make. Uh, that is, the shadow gets in and um, pushes us in a certain direction, motivates us to take a certain step, and we can't reverse that. Um, and then we look back and we think, wow, I wonder if I should, really should have done that. Maybe I shouldn't have, but you can't undo it. You can't redo the past. It is done. So you have to move forward and grieve the past or um, uh, remember it uh, and honor it, but you cannot go back into it. But don't we need that for wholeness? Need what? Well, a touch of the devil. I mean, exploring all sides of life. Unless you want to be a saint, yeah. <laughs> Which is but dangerous territory being a saint, isn't it? That's dangerous, yeah. Mm -hmm. Jung said it's um, not healthy to be too good because what you're leaving out is the shadow. Yes, uh, shadow enactments aren't always a bad thing. I mean, sometimes they really are. Uh, I mean, if you do terrible, terrible things um, that you uh, regret and go to prison for later or something like that. But um, the, uh, if you can get a hold of it and realize it later, uh, you can learn from it. We make mistakes. We do things that are regrettable for bad motives and bad reasons from a moral point of view, let's say. Um, but we also benefit uh, in another sense from it because there's energy there. It's moved us into a new place that we would not have arrived at otherwise. You certainly can see that here with uh, Hobie. Uh, he's sort of at a pinnacle of fame and fortune uh, that he wouldn't have achieved had the devil not nudged him to take this fateful step into uh, becoming a BTS member. Another line in the song, uh, he talks about the struggles, and he says that they helped me know myself. And I really like that because isn't that the goal, to know thyself? Indeed, yeah. Um, and it's not easy. Uh, the... Um, the reflections that we make in, uh, in analysis uh, back on our lives and mostly on our struggles, we don't think so much about the, the smooth sailing times, but we think about the moments of um, uh, struggle or wounding or injury or whatever. Um, and those are the ones that we can learn the most from, whether we were responsible for them or in what way we were responsible for them. But... Um, yeah, I think it's from the struggles that we uh, 
um, learn about ourselves and also in the moment that we struggle. You know, um, if you don't struggle to make a decision, you're leaving something undone. You're mm -hmm. doing it too easily. Um, when you look at the decision that was made by the senators the other day, you know, and you look, and Mitt Romney, for instance, talked about his struggle to break with his party and uh, vote in uh, on the other side of the aisle. Uh, you can see in his face that he struggled. He stayed up nights reading the Constitution and so on. It wasn't an easy choice. But in doing that, he learned something about himself. <clears throat> and uh, we learn from our struggles with hard decisions. Hard decisions like uh, getting married, getting divorced, having a child. Um, um, you know, these important moments in life, taking on a career path, so on. Looking at all sides. Yeah. yeah, not leaving anything out. And then at the end of the song, he sings about the map of the soul, map of the all. That's my ego. And I was wondering what you thought of that. I've I thought about that, too. Um, it's, uh, it's a psychological error to think that the ego is all. Um, that's to confuse the ego and the self, which you asked about okay. earlier. Right. <clears throat> but it is a moment when um, uh, the ego is exhilarated. Uh, this is what I mean. This is a celebration of ego. Mm -hmm. song. And in that moment of exhilaration, of having become oneself in the ego sense, I am I, um, one can think that is all, that, that consciousness is all, and I am the center of consciousness. Um, but uh, from a psychological point of view, that's an illusion. And what happens after that, uh, it's a moment of inflation. Uh, what happens after that is that the limitations that one didn't realize uh, exist in the, in the world, in the inner world and in the outer world, take their toll, and you realize that the I is not all. Um, it's kind of a moment of... Um, um, ego inflation where uh, he thinks that uh, he is the whole map, that he's got it knocked out, he's got it um, figured out. Mm -hmm. But that is a dangerous moment also. Let's discuss the difference between, and you touched on this in the last episode, the difference between a strong ego and a big ego. Well, the big ego is, is the one that we, in common parlance, talk about as, you know, being, uh, being selfish and uh, narcissistic. Uh, we say somebody has a big ego. A big ego is, is not a term that's used in, in um, Jungian psychology, but a strong ego is. Now, what is a strong ego as opposed to a weak ego? A weak ego can't bear very much suffering. A strong ego can bear a lot of suffering. Um, a strong ego can endure hardships, can uh, make its way through very tough times. A weak ego will collapse, will give up, um, will um, go uh, withdraw from, from the world and go into hiding. And when you think about people, for instance, I was recently reading, again, Viktor Frankl's book, um, Search for Meaning, Man's Search for Meaning. Yes, wow, that's a great book. Indeed, went through Auschwitz and survived, and more than survived, uh, because he had a purpose, he had a meaning, he wanted to write his book, he had a great idea for uh, a new type of psychotherapy that after Auschwitz and the war, he actually uh, set up in, in Vienna and was very successful. So he had what we would call a strong ego. Now, how does he account for it? He says it's because he had a sense of meaning. So what makes for a strong ego? Um, I think some people are maybe born with a tendency toward a stronger ego and others with a tendency toward a weaker one. But I think meaning is a very important factor in what we call a strong ego. If you have a sense of meaning, you can endure a lot of pain and hardship in order to survive and go on to, uh, you know, that your life... Uh, as meaning outside of that uh, or beyond that suffering. Well, what are some examples of meaning? You mean that I have meaning in my life, my life has meaning. Is, is, is that what you mean? Yeah, well, it can be anything. Uh, 
uh, I talked to somebody recently who said um, she she had been on the verge of suicide several times when she was young. Adolescence is quite normal. Uh, but she said she couldn't do it because her grandparents would have been too unhappy. Mm-hmm. And so the, the relationship gave her meaning. Um, now she has a child and she wouldn't do anything to hurt herself because she's living to be a good parent to the child. So um, what you're living for and gives your life meaning. So for some people, it's their work. For other people, it's relationship. Uh, ultimately, um, it, it might be a religious uh, feeling that your life has meaning because of uh, religious beliefs that you have, that um, God-given meaning to the individual life. So it's different for different people. Could be anything, right? It doesn't have to be something that other people would approve of, or it's something that is specific for you. And again, using the word meaning, it has meaning for you, and it doesn't necessarily have to make sense to anybody else. Is that right? That's right. It has meaning for you. You know, a lot of people die after Christmas. They hang on until Christmas because they want to see their family, and the family comes together, there's a last moment together, and they hang on and hang on for that moment. And then after that, they can let go. So uh, that has meaning for them. It has meaning to be with loved ones. Um, uh, and uh, for BTS now, uh, it has meaning to be um, successful and famous and do well. But that will change too. Uh, meaning changes. What gives your life meaning changes in the course. And they sing about this dreadful uh, disappearance of meaning actually in the in that song called Black Swan, which is also in this album, when meaning disappears and you enter into a very dark uh, moment, it's a kind of death where uh, the singer uh, or the song goes, you know, that uh, he's pulling back, he can hardly breathe, Um, he gives, do your thing with me, just do anything, uh, very passive. It's a dark mood, depressive, and this can come into being from within, a dark mood overtake you, an endogenous depression hit, and everything loses its meaning. Okay, right, so let, let me just tell the audience, so we're talking about the first single that was released ahead of the new album, Map of the Soul 7. The first single is called Black Swan. It was released in January of 2020, and it came out by being performed by BTS on The Late Late Show with James Corden. But actually, before that, the song was performed by a dance company, and that video was released. So that's when we first heard the song, and then we got to watch BTS perform the song on television. The film actually opens with a quote by Martha Graham that says, a dancer dies twice, once when they stop dancing, and this first death is the more painful. And I was wondering what your thoughts were about that and why they would choose that line. Exactly. Uh, Well, the dancer has lived uh, for dancing, and that's been the meaning of that dancer's life. You know, dancers like these BTS um, performers put everything into their into their work, into their um, professional vocation. And um, when that uh, when the dancer's uh, body gives out, and usually it's quite early. Uh, ballet dancers don't usually go on beyond their twenties. Um, their life's meaning is suddenly um, uh, uh, evaporates. And maybe BTS is anticipating this moment when the group will fall apart, when they will stop performing. And that will be their first death. The second death, of course, will be their physical death. Um, And just the thought of that, you know, that that things will end, Um, um, that one's... uh, uh, successful moments uh, in the spotlight will will come to a come to an end. The light will go out, and you'll be alone. You'll you'll be without uh, the audience and without the applause. It's a very difficult feeling to master, and this is a song about that. Um, the black swan, and, and I watched that performance a couple of times of of the uh, the ballet dancers, beautiful dancers. Um, 
And you can see the struggles of the white swan trying to fly and the black ones surrounding it and holding it back and holding it down. And um, it's, it's moving uh, um, without, uh, without success. It can't fly and it's being crushed. Um, and that's how moods affect us when we fall into a depression or our life loses its meaning. Um, and that can happen to anybody in many different ways. Uh, a loved one dies or you have an accident and you can't do any more what you could before. You have a stroke. Um, you um, lose your job. Um, many, many ways you can experience that moment in life. It's not the end of life. And those ballet dancers can find another career, perhaps teaching ballet or writing a book about ballet or doing something else in relation to that. Um, but it is a, a moment of darkness, and that's what this uh, Black Swan song is about. I wonder about the message that they're putting out there. Um, when I was first introduced to BTS, like I said, it was last year, right before Map of the Soul Persona was released. And prior to that, their album, I think it was a trilogy, it was called Love Yourself. And so when I was learning about BTS, I kept hearing about their positive message. And you and I were both really moved by their speech at the UN. That was incredible. So to have this dark theme kind of exposed here in Black Swan, and bringing up these very painful themes and, and death and losing your profession and, and kind of what that dance symbolized. Um, I, I, I don't know, I wonder how this is affecting the fans or the BTS army. And is this necessary? Is it because it can't be all love yourself? It has to be the entire map, I mean, covering the entire psyche? I mean, what are your thoughts on the darkness of this theme? Well, I think they, <clears throat> I think they set out to cover <clears throat> a lot of psychological territory. And it's for the benefit uh, of themselves, uh, of course, and their fans to become aware of um, all these different nuances and, and themes in life. And when the fans see that, um, uh, I imagine it humanizes the BTS for them. Uh, humanize, these, these are incredibly beautiful, uh, athletic, um, healthy looking uh, young individuals. And um, they could be beyond reach. You know, they could be like the gods, uh, immortal, eternal, and they're saying they're not. Um, and so the fans might take that on board as um, consoling. Uh, you know, it's, it's comforting to know that um, everybody suffers like I do. Uh, these are the things I worry about. I have these kinds of moods. I will have to face these kinds of issues, but also celebratory, uh, celebrating um, uh, Dionysus in the, in the last one, a great liberation moment and um, so I think they're they're combining the light and the dark in a in a complex way that I think Jung would have been happy about because that's the way life is and that's the way the psyche is. You know, and I, I'm glad you brought up gods because we forgot to cover that part of ego, the song ego, in the music video, J Hope, his face is superimposed on these images, these paintings of these ancient gods. And we didn't discuss that. I had some questions about it, uh, people wondering what that meant. Do you recall that part of the video? I saw it. Um, I, I don't recall who the gods were, probably doesn't make much difference. But again, that's a part of the inflation. When the ego comes to itself in this way, and celebrates itself, it does um, uh, feel, feel godlike. And as I said before, it's a dangerous moment because it's, um, it exaggerates um, uh, its capacities and, um, and its uh, ability to control life and events. You know, the gods are, 
imagined by human beings to uh, live um, a more or less pain-free life. Now, with the Greek gods, that's not true. They're very active and they suffer and some get wounded sometimes and they have to be healed. And so they're, they're quite human. Uh, the, um, but in most pantheons, uh, the gods are beyond human suffering. They're beyond time. Uh, they create and they destroy. They have control of time itself. Uh, they're beyond time. Uh, so they're very different from the way we experience our lives uh, on the ground, in the body. And so, again, the difference between the ego and uh, the archetypes, uh, the archetypal images, um, is important to recognize. The Greeks talked about hubris. You know, when the humans start thinking that they're gods, they're going to be punished. They're going to be struck down. And um, actually, in the, um, in the uh, interlude shadow song, he is begging not to fly, uh, not to fly too high, because there's a realization there uh, that um, the, uh, the puer who flies too high, puer is the young man, the young boy, who flies too high will get burned by the sun, will collapse, will fall, will come to no good end. And so there's anxiety about that. Uh, in the ego song, you don't have that. It's more affirmative. And I think it's another moment of um, um, affirming uh, the life of the ego, which can also be a beautiful thing, shining and shimmering, as he says. Um, and again, it's in line with the way Jung felt about the ego. The ego is not a bad thing. Uh, the ego is our consciousness. It's our awareness. And it's um, uh, very wrapped up with our individuality. Um, so we do, in Jungian psychology, affirm the ego, and we think it's a good thing to have one and to have a strong one, but not an inflated one. <laughs> so, yeah. So how about we take some questions from Twitter now? Okay. At Magic Shop Books asks, uh, my favorite lyric of the song, Ego, is, my dancing was chasing ghosts which I interpret as J-Hope using his passion, dance, since he's a dancer, to exercise his shadow. I'd love to know Dr. Stein's thoughts about this lyric and the integration of the shadow in the ego. Hmm. I, I wondered about that line myself with my dance chasing a ghost. Uh, it, uh, let me just read that whole line if I could. It starts off with, the, with him recognizing the difference between his, um, um, we, we could call it his ego, his human ego, the life of Jung Ho Suk, or um, that's that's his actual name. Yeah, Hobie. Is, <laughs> Hobie. Uh, the life of Hobie, who is not J-Hope, flashes across my mind. It must have been um, full of regret with no hope till I die. With my dance chasing a ghost, with me blaming my dream and casting doubt on why I live and breathe. Oh my God, God, God. So I think he's, um, you know, it's, it's a, a moment of reflection in this song. Um, chasing a ghost is chasing something that uh, is very ephemeral, that either doesn't exist or it's... Um, it's uh, beyond something that we can grasp. Um, uh, uh, I think he is expressing some regret here um, that uh, he has been chasing an, uh, something ephemeral, like a, a mirage. Um, and um, that would be a, a realization of... Um, uh, the ego on the ego's part that um, you know it has uh, been suffering from um, uh, the um, pursuit of projections. Um, you know we project all kinds of things onto the world and onto other people, and then we chase after them, and then we realize that there's nothing there, or what we thought was there isn't there. It's a mirage, mm -hmm. uh, and so it's a, a moment of realization and coming. Again, coming to yourself, a way to you know strengthen the ego is to look 
look past the projections, take them back and, um, uh, and kind of cleanse your uh, mirrors or cleanse your um, windshield so that you can see more clearly what's actually around you and what's out there. As long as you're projecting, you're, you're not um, relating to reality very well. What's yours and what's somebody else's differentiating that? And then in this person's question, um, he mentions exercise his shadow. I, I wouldn't put it that way. Now, would you that the shadow needs to be exercised? I, I, that's kind of not what we're looking for, right? Uh, exorcism is um, getting rid of the shadow. Uh, you know, you exercise, uh, exercise uh, a house, of, a haunted house or something like that to get rid of the demons. But then the question is, where do they go? So uh, the idea isn't to repress the shadow, to get rid of it, and drive it further into the darkness, but rather to um, uh, face it and acknowledge it and uh, take responsibility, uh, included in consciousness of, your, of the self. The shadow is a part of the self. Mm -hmm. We don't get rid of it. And I do get asked a lot because I've been talking about the shadow since the beginning of this podcast. I believe that it is a very important uh, part of Jung's work and the work we do in analysis. And I get asked a lot, well, how do we integrate the shadow? And I know I've talked about that on that on this podcast quite a number of times, but it's all over these questions that I have still, even though we're talking about ego, people still want don't really fully grasp and it's the shadow and it's not an easy concept to understand you know the we're not supposed to be getting rid of anything and i don't think we can get rid of but we can learn to manage things right right and this gives me the opportunity to mention that um, map of the soul's shadow was released yesterday yes. by Ron. so this is the second volume in this series <clears throat> on map of the soul um in response to BTS, the first one was Persona, the second one is Shadow. So it's now available uh, online from Chiron Publications, or I think at Amazon. And in that volume, um, um, I write uh, most of it. So I'll, uh, probably if you if you read in there, you'll, you'll get some answers to your questions. Um, and there are a number of other contributors uh, to the volume as well. Uh, so um, I talk about shadow chasing. Um, you know, we like to do that. We find it in other people. We find it in the world around us. And the idea of taking back the shadow projections is to find that thing that we see as, um, you know, uh, dark or evil or bad in the others somewhere in ourselves. And how do we do that? Um, there are a number of ways that we can get a hold of our shadow, it's very hard to see behind yourself, but maybe somebody else can tell you about your shadow, a close friend, uh, or you might have a dream in which uh, shadow figures appear. Um, but um, uh, we, we do quite a bit of work with this in uh, analytic work to uh, try to get close to the shadow, uh, not to humiliate or embarrass anybody or to make them feel guilty, but to see clearly their role and their responsibility in uh, certain things that happen in their relationships or in their jobs and mm -hmm. so on. Uh, people who are without shadow awareness tend to constantly be victims and blame everybody else for their problems. Yes. The world is bad. They're innocent. They're good. The world around them is all bad. <clears throat> and it's very hard to break through that kind of a, um, a mentality um, um, because it's uh, invested in not feeling guilty. Well, when you touch shadow, you feel a little guilt, you feel some shame. But that's, that shouldn't stop you from uh, recognizing your responsibility and then watching. And as you say, you, uh, if you know it's there and you know it's active, it's easier to uh, prevent it repeating in exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. And I used to ask my analyst, you know, why? Why do this work? Why should I bother? And she would say, because your life will work better. Yes, exactly. 
The new book is called Map of the Soul Shadow, Our Hidden Self. It's with you, uh, Drs. Stephen Buser and Leonard Cruz, who are the co-publishers of Chiron Publications. And Dr. Buser was on episode 49 um, when the subject was the series on Jung's Red Book for Our Time. And also, there is another author, Dr. Sarah L. Stein. Would you tell us a little bit about her? And is there any relation? She's my daughter. Yes. She's your daughter. I didn't know that. Yes, and she wrote a, a chapter for that book that was based on a, um, a webinar that we did with Asheville a while back. She's um, a um, criminal justice person. She has a doctorate in, in criminal justice, and she's taught at several universities in this area. And she writes about the, um, the criminal as shadow bearer for society. Um, yeah. that's very wow. interesting. Uh, perception, you know, that the criminals, the people we lock up in prisons, mm -hmm. in a way become scapegoats. So we feel, we feel we aren't criminals, they're the criminals, yeah. they're the criminals. So oh, they I catch a lot of projections. Yeah. And so that's, that's what you wrote about in there. Mm -hmm. So we have time for one more question. And I was asked by somebody about Jung's concept of synchronicity. And you had mentioned that, I believe, in one of the episodes we did last year around Map of the Soul persona, that synchronicity possibly being a theme in one of BTS's upcoming albums. And this song, Black Swan, reminded you of a book called The Black Swan by Nassim Nicholas Tlaib. And would you tell us why? Yes. Um Talib uh, wrote a book after the financial 2008 financial crisis called The Black Swan, <clears throat> in which he um, uses that image uh, of, um, he said they, uh, in, in the, um, I don't know, 19th century or so, uh, nobody thought black swans existed, only white swans. Swans were white. There was no such thing as a black swan. And then somebody suddenly just, uh, found one somewhere in Australia, and it was a, a big um, surprise that such a, such a thing could possibly exist. Mm -hmm. And so he takes this notion of the surprise, and he applies it to the economic crisis that occurred in 2008. And he says the black swan event is something that happens totally out of the blue. Nobody expects it. Nobody could have predicted it. Um, uh, it comes as a complete surprise to everybody and has devastating effects. So the black swan event uh, led to the collapse of um, various uh, wall houses on Wall Street mm -hmm. and banking system and a lot of people's mortgages and so on and so forth. Um, so the black swan event is um, uh, a disaster that comes unforeseen and unexpected, just out of the blue. Now, this song, uh, Black Swan, was released by um, BTS toward the end of the year. Uh, I don't know the exact date, but um, toward the end of 2019, I saw it for the first time, <clears throat> I think in January, early January <clears throat> 2020. And at the same time, there was a Black Swan event uh, being uh, released uh, in uh, Wuhan, China. Um, it's called the coronavirus. And the coronavirus uh, began in a, a small uh, open air market in Wuhan. And a, a virus uh, was transferred from an animal to a human and um, spread quite rapidly. It was The Chinese government tried to keep it under uh, under wraps, it didn't uh, take sufficient precautions, and before anybody knew what was happening, it was wildly out of control. And so today, uh, here we are in February, early February 7th, of 2020, the whole world is aware of the coronavirus. Um, uh, cruise ships have been um, uh, turned into hospitals, and uh, many people are in shutdown massive shutdowns uh, situations in China, in Wuhan, in Nanjing, and other cities. The borders have been closed to Hong Kong. Uh, and so we have a massive 
destructive, threatening event uh, on the world scene that corresponds in time to the release of this Black Swan song put out by the BTS. Now, you could say that is a synchronicity in that the two events are completely unrelated, causally. One didn't cause the other. They were developed completely independently of each other, and yet they coincide in time, and it could have a meaningful consequence on uh, um, various uh, exposures that uh, BTS has to the public, I suppose, in its concerts. They might have to um, postpone some concerts or um, cancel them. Or uh, um, it's, uh, it's just a, a strange coincidence. Uh, the essence of synchronicity in Jung's definition is that mm-hmm. it has a meaning. And to discover what that meaning is, is not so easy. Um, is it um, you know, a meaning for BTS? Is it a meaning for the world? Is it, uh, um, it depends on how people take it. Um, but um, I, I, I did note that when I was studying the Black Swan song, uh, it suddenly occurred to me, well, we're right in the midst of a Black Swan event. Isn't that interesting? Mm-hmm. Well, definitely something to keep our eye on, and uh, we hope for the best. So, Dr. Stein, you will be returning at the end of February or thereabouts to discuss the full album once it's released, Map of the Soul 7, on February 21st, 2020. So we look forward to hearing your thoughts once we've had a chance to hear all the songs. Okay. Thank you, Laura. Please visit the website, Speaking of Jung, that's J U N G dot com, for more information on what was discussed in this episode. There you will also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to stream or to download for free. This podcast is also available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, TuneIn, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And the audio of this episode will be available on our YouTube channel, Jungi and Laura. You can also listen on your Amazon Echo device simply by saying, Alexa, play Speaking of Jung on Apple Podcasts or tune in. Just be sure to pronounce Jung with a hard J. You can help support this podcast at no extra cost to you simply by shopping at Amazon.com through any of the Amazon links on our website, or by registering through our links for any of the online video courses offered by the Jung Society of Washington, D.C. You can start these courses anytime, go at your own pace, and you'll have lifetime access to the material. You can find all the details on the courses page at speakingofjung.com. With special thanks to all of the members of BTS and their creative and support staffs, and to the BTS Army, this is Laura London, and you've been listening to Speaking of Jung.